Welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure today to introduce Shreya Arya, who will be telling us about a sheaf theoretic construction of shape space. Okay. Thank you so much to the organizers. Um, and thank you all for those who are here. Um, today, I'll be talking about a sheaf theoretic construction of shape space. This is joint work with Justin Curry and Shayan Mukherjee. Okay. Um, so today I will talk about shapes and shape spaces. But before we get into that, uh, the first question is, what are shapes? So even though geometry and topology is the study of shapes and provides intuitions about shapes, the term shape is not a mathematical or a technical term. And the study of shapes and shape comparison was, it has a long history and it was uh, pointed out by Thompson um, in his book on growth and form, which was published in 1917. And it was the first of its kind where it, it's, and it's important for mor morphology or morphogenesis, which is basically how do patterns and forms arise in nature and biology. And in this picture, uh, in this picture here, we see a human skull, which is embedded in the plane in R2. And if we deform the plane, in a conformal way, we first get a skull of a chimpanzee, and then it goes on to a skull of a baboon. And he was trying to understand whether closely related species were related to each other by some kind of deformation of the ambient space. And this was an inspiration for uh, pattern theory by Grenander or um, statistical shape theories. And so, um, now we'll talk about some shape space models or shape theories, which were done in the past. So first we have the landmark base shape space. This was uh, pioneered by Kendall, where, where shapes are collections of bi biologically significant hand-picked landmark points. So each shape is a collection of these points, modular rotation and scaling. So um, out here, we see a couple of teeth of different species, and uh, there are some points which are the landmarks. And now the question about uh, similarity between shapes is uh, really understanding how much the landmark points have moved from, from one another. Um, another shape space model is the diffeomorphism-based shape space, um, where, where initially you start off with a fixed template, so a fixed shape, and then look at all the shapes that are diffeomorphic to that shape. And now understanding um, you know, differences or distances between shapes is the cost of moving from one shape to another shape. And that is really, um, that can be encoded in, in like the energy of, of the diffeomorphism. And so today I will be talking about another shape space model, which is quite different from the previous two models. And, and to describe a shape space model, uh, I need to answer the following two questions. The first one is, what is an appropriate representation of our shape? So, um, so what in, in computer science language, this could be seen as what is the right data structure for our shape? How do we represent our shape? What is the descriptor of our shape? So in the landmark based shape space, a shape was a collection of points. Um, and so we want to come up with an, a new description of, of shapes. And the second question is, can this descriptor express variation between shapes? And so uh, we, try to, we try to come up with a shape space model that answers these two questions with the following goals in mind. So the first one is we want to compare shapes without necessarily having one-to-one -one correspondences. So common to both of the approaches in the previous shape space models are um, in landmark based shape space, uh, the one-one correspondence maps between shapes are just maps between, between the landmarks. And in the diffeomorphism based shape space, the maps are diffeomorphisms. So we want to, uh, we want to generalize and, and do away with this uh, one-one correspondences between the shapes. Secondly, we want a lossless descriptor of shapes. So as in Kendall shape spaces or landmark-based shape spaces, 
a shape is a collection of points. And so it doesn't contain all the information. We want to come up with a descriptor that contains all the information about the shape. And lastly, um, the past years, um, shapes have been assumed to be smooth manifolds, and we want to do away with that assumption. We want to incorporate a larger class of shapes, including like polytopes, semi-algebraic sets, and so on. And we just wanted to satisfy some mild tame, tameness properties. So in this talk, um, um, I will show you how we construct an algebraic, uh, algebraic construction of shape space, which satisfies these goals. Okay. So now I can tell you what the shapes are. Um, so we work in the setting of definable sets uh, with respect to an O-minimal structure on RD. So logicians have uh, come up with axioms which describe a, a nice class of, class of sets. And these uh, nice class of sets um, uh, get rid of um, pathological sets like uh, space-filling curves or Cantor-like sets and so on. Um, and so we define a constructible set to be a definable subset of RD, which is also compact. For us, shapes are constructible sets. And so the important thing here is that we take shapes to be uh, sets which are nice in some sense and don't have uh, don't have like these topological infinities like Cantor sets or fractals and so on. And these include um, semi-algebraic sets and uh, polytopes and so on. Okay. So um, now that we've described what the shapes are, we we talk about the descriptor of our shapes. So the representative that we choose is the persistent homology transform. So the persistent homology transform is a topological transform of the shape. And the idea is that suppose we look at this blue uh, V shape here, and if we look in the direction, uh, in the upward direction, we filter or we perform the sublevel set filtration in this direction, in the up direction, and then we record the persistence diagram in that direction. But there's no there's no reason to choose the top direction. We can look at all the directions parameterized by the circle. So for every direction, we perform the sublevel set filtration in that direction, and we record the persistence diagram in those directions. So the persistent homology transform of a constructible set M in RD is the continuous map from the D minus one dimensional sphere to the diagram space. So for every direction V, we uh, record the persistence diagrams filtered in those directions in all cohomological or homological degrees. Okay. Um, there is another definition, um, and this is, we can just repackage the definition as a sheaf. And the way to do so is, um, so if we, if you look at this picture here, suppose we have a shape M and we want to filter in the direction V. So by filtering, I mean, we look in this direction and uh, we filter and we stop at time T and we, we end up with this blue shaded region, which is the sublevel set at direction V at time T. And the total space, so we define the total space ZM, which is the triple XVT such that X dot V is less than T. This can be thought of as the disjoint union of all the sublevel sets in all different directions and at all times T. So ZM is just the is just a union of all the sublevel sets. And now we can equip this with a natural projection down to SD minus one cross R by just projecting onto the first two factors on the last two factors. And what's important here is that the fiber of this map records the sublevel sets. So in particular, if we choose a particular V and a T, then the fiber stores the blue shaded region. So the fiber records the sublevel set in that direction and stopped at that time T. So the sheaf definition of the PHT or the, the ith PHT sheaf is the ith Lyrae sheaf associated to the projection map FM. And this is basically just saying that it is a sheaf associated to the following map. We take any test open U in SD minus one cross R and we associate to it the cohomology 
of the pre-image of that U under this projection map. So the essence of this definition is, is given by the stock level description. So for every V and for every T, we record the cohomology of this blue shaded region or the, of the sublevel set. So that, that's the definition. For every, for every direction and for every time, we're recording the cohomology of the sublevel set filtered in that direction and stocked at that time t. Okay. And so um, uh, just to explain that using some pictures. So if we look at the shape, V shape here, to the extreme right, we can see the sheaf. Um, and so for every, since we're, we're just working in, in two dimensions, we're just looking at the circle. So the circle cross, cross R is a cylinder. And so on the cylinder, for every direction V and for every time T, we're storing the cohomology of the sublevel set. And we can, we can visualize it in the plane by essentially taking this infinite cylinder and squashing it down to the plane, where at, at the origin, we have T is equal to negative infinity. And as we grow along the radius, um, we increase the t value. So this, this uh, bold circle here represents t equals to zero. So let me explain that a little further. Um, suppose we're looking towards the right. At t equal to negative four, we see one component. So the cohomology is k, or the field coefficient. And so in this picture here, if we're looking in this direction, uh, at time equal to negative four, we have we have a point here, which is which is inside the blue shaded region here. So the blue shaded region in this in this picture is just one copy of K or one connected component, and this darker blue re uh, region is K two or uh, two connected components. And so if you look in another direction, we at t equal to negative eight, we have we lie in the blue region, the lighter blue region. So we have one connected component. And as we increase T and we go to T equal to negative five, we see that we're in the darker blue shaded region, which corresponds to uh, two connected components. And in this way, we can visualize the sheet. So, so basically, uh, the essence of the definition is that for every V and T, we're recording the cohomology of the sublevel set. But this definition, for, for this definition, we need to make the choice of degree i. So we need to define it for each degree i. Instead, we can look at this as, as a derived sheaf. So, so here's another definition for the PhD, which is the derived, the derived version. So the PhD of M is the right derived push forward of the projection map of the uh, constant sheaf on ZM. And this belongs to the derived category of sheaves on SD minus one cross R. So what is this really saying? It's saying that instead of storing the cohomology of the sublevel set, we store the whole singular cochain complex from which that cohomology arises. So note that this is a class of uh, cochain complexes which are quasi isomorphic to each other. So the idea is that Instead of storing for each degree i, instead of storing the cohomology of the fiber or the sublevel set at i, we store the whole singular cochain complex which, from which that cohomology arises. And that's the derived version. So it's like a total definition. We don't need to de uh, define it for every degree i. OK. Um, so far, we described three different versions of the persistent homology transform. We choose the persistent homology transform as our shape representative because it, because it is sufficient. And by that, I mean that, is, that it is injective. So this was shown first for um, embedded simplicial complexes, and then it was shown for constructible sets using, uh, using Shapira's inversion theorem for the Radon transform. So this basically says, if the PhD of two shapes are equal, then the shapes itself must have been equal. So it's an injective transform. And so, which is why uh, we choose the PhD as our representative for the shape, for, for each shape. Okay. Um, another transform, which is related to the PhD or the persistent homology transform, is the Euler characteristic transform. Uh, the Euler characteristic transform um, is basically you again filter in a particular direction, but instead of 
storing the cohomology of the sublevel sets, we store the Euler characteristics of the sublevel sets. And so if you look at this picture, if you're filtering in the top direction, out here we see that the Euler characteristic is two. And so, and then when it merges at this point here, the Euler characteristic uh, is one. And so the definition is, again, it's a it's again a map from the sphere to, uh, to L2 functions in R, um, where for every direction V, we associate to it the Euler characteristic curve. Okay, so, so far we described the shapes, we described our representative for the shapes, and now, and now we, we discuss the algebra of this transform. Um, in fact, we show that, that the map which takes the shape to its description to the persistent homology transform, that map is a sheaf. Okay, so to do that, first we need to describe our base category. So the base category is just the category of all constructible sets or shapes, as we said. So the objects of this category are constructible sets in RD. And the morphisms of this category are inclusion maps. And, uh, and what we would like to do is construct a sheaf on this category. OK. Uh, so a pre-sheaf on a topological space X is a functor from open sets in X to the category C. And what we would like to do is, is have a sheaf on, on this category. So you would want to replace the topological space X with the category of constructible sets on RD. And um, and so we need to we need to define a notion of open sets on this category. Uh, this can be done by, by using a growth and deep topology. And so a growth and deep topology is a way to generalize or to way, a way to top topologize categories. And the way, they, uh, the way to prescribe a growth and deep topology is by um, defining covering maps or covering morphisms. So what we're doing is we, we want to topologize a category and we do so by a growth and deep topology where we prescribe the covering morphisms to be a finite collection of jointly surjective inclusions. And in this way, we can give a topology to our category. So, so now that we have a topology on our category, we can, we can describe um, a pre-sheaf. Okay, so the first thing to notice is that if we include a subset A into M, then we have an associated inclusion of total spaces, so of ZA into ZM. So remember, ZA was the total space associated to A, so it was uh, the disjoint union of all the sublevel sets of A. And similarly, ZM is the disjoint union of all the sublevel sets of M. And now, if we restrict cohomology of the sublevel sets in, a, in M to those in A, this gives us a sheaf morphism. And so we have a map from PhD of M to PhD of A. And this is essentially saying that the assignment from M to PhD of M is a pre-sheaf. So basically what we've said so far is that given, given a constructible set or given, given a shape M, the map which takes M to its persistent homology transform, PhD M, is a pre-sheaf. Or is it, it, it's, a, it's a contravariant functor. Okay. We would like to upgrade this definition. Uh, we, we would like to see that this is, this is actually a sheaf. And so that means it satisfies some gluing conditions. Um, in other words, we want, to, we, we want to show that the PhD satisfies local to global conditions. So in other words, we can glue together the PhD of smaller shapes to get the PhD of a larger shape. That's what we want to show. So in general, the sheaf axiom looks like the following. So if we have a cover U, uh, the sheaf axiom is when F of U is isomorphic to, to, a, to the limit of this check tower. But oftentimes, um, we work with um, 
with sheaves on vector spaces, on groups, and in general, abelian categories. And so, and so if we look at this whole check tower, it suffices to look at the, the kernel of this map. Because in abelian categories, kernels, co-kernels, limits, co-limits, they exist. But for us, these FFUIs are complexes of sheaves in the derived category, because this F here is the persistent homology transform, which is a derived sheaf. And so now, no longer we have vector spaces here, but we have complexes of sheaves. And so, and this is not an abelian category. And so we actually have to consider this whole check tower. Kernels and co-kernels may not exist. And we have to in, replace the, the notion of a limit with the homotopy limit, which is a weaker notion of limit. It's basically a limit up to homotopy. And so what we show is that the persistent homology transform satisfies the homotopy sheaf axiom. So the assignment, which takes a constructible set M to its persistent homology transform, that assignment is, is, is a homotopy sheaf, which means it satisfies this, this descent condition. Um, and there are a couple of ways to actually view this. One way is by looking at the PhD as an object in the derived infinity category, but another more concrete description is, is via spectral sequences. So recall that um, these F of UIs, these are complexes of sheaves in the derived category. And so out here, we have complexes. And so this is a natural setting where we got by complexes. And so the homotopy sheaf axiom is, is basically witnessed by spectral sequences. And let me explain that a little more clearly. Um, so, so suppose we are given, um, we're given a cover M of our shape. Um, and so just to uh, establish some notation here, suppose we are given uh, our shape M here and we filter in direction V and stop at time T, we denote the sublevel set by MVT. So this is just some notation. MVT is a sublevel set corresponding to V, uh, uh, corresponding to V and T. Now, if we look at the constant sheet supported on the total space of ZM, uh, we can write a resolution of this by the covers. And, and now if we apply the push forward of our projection map, so if we apply the push forward of our projection map and we take stocks um, because um, for simplicity, uh, we're just looking at the stock level descriptions, then we can resolve each of these by singular co-chain uh, by the by singular co-chain complexes. So in other words, what we're doing here is that we're saying, um, so this is a this column here represents the singular co-chain complexes of the cover elements. So here we're just looking at the cover elements um, MI. And in this column here, we're looking at the singular co-chains, but at the intersection of the cover level. So here uh, I equals to two uh, denotes depth two. So here we're looking at the uh, singular co-chains on the covers. Here we're looking at the singular co-chains on the intersection of the covers and so on. We can do this for triple intersections and so on. So this, this diagram grows, um, is, it continues. And now if we take cohomology vertically, we end up with the E1 E1 page of the spectral sequence. And if we take cohomology horizontally now, we end up with the E2 page. And as spectral sequences go, the E2 page converges to the cohomology of the sublevel set MVT. So to the sublevel set. So essentially, essentially what the sheaf axiom is doing, it is encoding a Maya Vitoris spectral sequence for the PhD. So one way to view this sheaf axiom is a Maya Vitoris sequence, but for, for the persistent homology transform. And um, that was a little too technical. So let's just see um, what this axiom is for, for an example. So out here, we're looking at a circle and we cover the circle by two parts. So we have uh, part A, 
which is the green part, and part B, which is the orange part. Uh, the two points here are the intersection. So the purple point and the blue point. Okay. And now we can write out the PhD sheaf in degree zero of part A and of part B. So this was the same uh, visual representation um, I showed you all earlier. So this is just a visual representation of the sheaf. Okay. And then we can also find out the uh, the PhD of the intersection, so of the blue and the purple point, and it looks like this. Um, the sheaf axiom basically says that we can find the PhD of the whole circle using the information from the PhD of A, the PhD of B, and the PhD of the intersection. So essentially, this is just a Maya Vitoris spectral sequence for for the persistent homology transform. So we can glue together the persistent homology transforms um, of each of the parts to get the persistent homology transform of the whole shape. So this, this is, in this way, it satisfies the local to global condition. Okay, um, there's a simpler interpretation to this sheaf axiom. And, and in some sense, this is a decategorification of the sheaf axiom. So, Remember, the Euler characteristic transform was for every direction and every time was storing the, uh, the Euler characteristic of the sublevel set. So if we want to witness the homotopy sheaf axiom, but in the context of Euler characteristic transforms, it turns out to be an inclusion-exclusion principle. Okay. So by that, uh, by that uh, what do I mean? So if we look at the circle here, the same circle as before, um, it covered by A and B, then the Euler characteristic transform of the circle is the Euler characteristic transform of A plus the Euler characteristic transform of B minus the Euler characteristic transform of A into section B. And this is, so this is just a realization of the homotopy sheaf axiom, but to functions. And so, so all all so the sheaf axiom is just saying that we can we can construct the transform of the larger shape by just looking at smaller pieces of that shape. Okay. Um, uh, next, we we have a nerve lemma for the persistent homology transform. So, so suppose we're looking at a convex set A in R D. Now we're looking at a convex set. So if we if we look at the sublevel sets of this convex set, they're always going to be contractible because it's convex. And since the sublevel sets of a convex set are contractible, we know that the persistent homology transform is going to be concentrated in degree zero because all the higher homology vanishes. Now, since we since since what we're doing is we are uh, where we're show, we've showed that we have this local to global condition, we can think of a polytope as glued together convex spaces. And so, uh, and so now, using the spectral sequence we constructed before, we have that we have that the higher homology vanishes because higher homology of the cover vanishes. So. Because, because the polyhedron is covered by convex faces, and the convex faces are concentrated only in degree zero homology because the sublevel sets are just contractible, the higher homology of the covers vanishes. And so we just end up with degree zero homology. So essentially, what we're saying is that the nth degree or the nth PhD of n is the nth cohomology of this complex here. So we're saying that we can we can uh, we can construct the higher higher degree homology of the PhD just by looking at zero zero degree information of the covers. And so this is a nerve lemma for for the persistent homology transform. And it's much simpler to look at zero degree information because we're just looking at connected components rather than looking at loops and so on. Okay. 
So, so, so far, we provided an algebraic construction of our shape space. So we started off with a base four set of constructible sets. And then to each constructible set, we associated to it its persistent homology transform. And we showed that this assignment here is a sheaf or a homotopy sheaf. Uh, so it satisfies nice local to, local to global properties. And out here, I, I just want to pause for a minute to, um, to try to compare previous shape models with our shape, shape space models. So previously, we had, uh, we had, we had a fiber bundle-like structure in, in the previous models of shape space, so in the, in, in the landmark base and the diffeomorphism-based shape space. And now we have a sheaf-like sheaf structure. And so um, this makes sense because we're we're generalizing from where we're including a larger class of shapes and sheaves can sheaves can be thought of as a way of generalizing fiber bundles. So it makes sense that we obtained a sheaf um, because we're generalizing to a higher to to a larger category of shapes. Okay. So so that completes the first part of the talk where we where we described an algebraic construction, we described what the description of our shape should be. But now we want to, we want to check whether these descriptions, can, ex can they express variation in our shapes? And the first question is, are these, are these descriptions stable? Is the persistent homology transform a stable transform? So that means if, if, the, sh if the shape is perturbed a little bit, uh, the are the transforms um, also, are the transforms also, do the transforms only change a little bit? That's the question. We, we don't want the transform to drastically change when we just change the shapes just by a little bit. And so we want to show that the persistent homology transform is a stable transform. And to do that, we, uh, we have to define some metrics on our PhD. Okay. So, the first metric we define um, is the interleaving type uh, distances. So, so recall that the PhD was essentially storing topological information of the sublevel sets at all directions v and at all times t. So we define an epsilon thickening of the PhD. And out here, what we're doing is instead of storing topological information, at directions v and at time t, we're storing the topological information of the sublevel set of this whole of this whole region. So we're storing the uh, the in topological information of m v t plus epsilon. So we're thickening our sublevel sets. We're storing topological information of our thickened sub sublevel set. For every v and t, we're storing the topological information of m v t plus epsilon, and that's the thickening of the PhD then we can define an epsilon interleaving of the PhD of M and the PhD of N by a pair of morphisms um, such that the, this diagram commutes. And the interleaving distance between the PhD of M and the PhD of N is the minimum epsilon such that there exists uh, an epsilon interleaving. And in the case where there is no epsilon, in that case, we say that the interleaving distance is infinite. Okay. So there's a second type of, uh, there, there, uh, we can also consider Wasserstein, Wasserstein type metrics where, where we use the diagram version definition of our PhD. So essentially we, we define the PQ uh, PhD uh, distance in degree i between two shapes m and n as the Wasserstein distance between the distance diagrams, and we integrate it over all, all directions. And so two important cases of this definition are when q is infinity. When q is infinity, we're just looking at the maximum Wasserstein distance between the persistent diagrams filtered in direction v over all directions. And when P is equal to infinity, um, we have the bottleneck distance, the Wasserstein 
infinity distance this is the bottleneck distance on persistence diagrams. So the special case is when P is infinity and Q is infinity. And in this case, we have the maximum bottleneck distance of the persistence diagram filtered in a direction over, over all the directions. And we call this the PHT bottleneck distance in degree i. So we're basically taking the bottleneck distance over all the persistence diagrams filtered in all different directions, and we're taking the maximum of those. OK, so, so for example, if we look at just two point clouds, so we look at point clouds A and B of the same size, then in this case, we actually have the interleaving distance equal to the uh, zero degree bottleneck PHD distance. And what does this mean? Um, what does this mean? It basically says that we look at the two point clouds A and B, we, found, we find the best optimal matching between the point clouds A and B, and then we look at the maximum distance between points in A and points in B. And this is the interleaving distance, and which is equal to the PhD bottleneck distance. And most importantly, um, uh, the interleaving distance between the persistent homology transform of M and N is greater than the PhD bottleneck distance uh, in degree I uh, for all over all eyes for all eyes. So it's greater than the maximum I um, P of the bottleneck distance between the PhDs. Okay, so we we show now that the the persistent homology transform are representative for the shape they are stable with respect to both of these metrics. So suppose we look at two shapes M and N that are homotopic to each other. And further, the homotopy is such that it's epsilon controlled. By this, I mean that the homotopy does not move the points more than epsilon away. So two shapes M and M are homotopic and the homotopy between these two shapes do not move the points more than epsilon. In this case, we have that the, the persistent homology, the interleaving distance between the two transforms of the two shapes is less than epsilon. And because of the relationship we described earlier, this also gives us that the, the bottleneck distance, the PhD bottleneck distance is also stable. Okay, so, so, so far what we've shown is that uh, for shapes that are epsilon controlled, or uh, that have an epsilon controlled homotopy, um, they're stable with respect to the distances we defined. Okay, and the interleaving distance can be hard to compute in practice, uh, but the stability theorem provides some way to approximate it. So out here, uh, we're looking at two shapes. So the blue shape and the red shape and, uh, and the PhD bottleneck distance between these two shapes actually corresponds to the direction uh, in VI or uh, V1 or V2. And so this, this is actually the maximum distance. And so we get uh, the distance between the PhD bottleneck distance to be six root five. But these shapes A and B are also homeomorphic to each other. And the maximum and the home and the homeomorphism moves the point at most to root two. This is the maximum the points are moved. And so, so we know that it's uh, the shapes are two root two stable. And so the interleaving distance is lesser than two root two, but it's greater than six root five by the relationship we express between the bottleneck distance and the interleaving distance. So this is one way to approximate the interleaving distance between shapes. Okay. Um, so now uh, we, we describe some approximations of the PhD. So, so remember, for polyhedra, we showed that PhD zero, degree zero PhD information is enough because we can cover our shape with convex faces and the convex faces are contractible, so the higher homology vanishes. But this is not true for all shapes. So for example, if you just look at a sphere, any space with curvature, and we wish to cover it by say these orthents, there, there exists some direction where the sublevel set has non-trivial 
uh, homology, uh, non-trivial H1. And so, and so what we show is that we can, if we look at any submanifold M, and for any epsilon, we can construct a polyhedron N um, in such a way that the persistent homology transforms of M and N are epsilon close. So even though for general class of shapes, PhD uh, zero information is not enough, we can always approximate it to a polyhedron such that the PhDs of these shapes are close. Okay. Um, with that, um, um, just to conclude some concluding thoughts about uh, shape spaces. So, so, so first of all, we constructed a new model of shape space, an algebraic construction, where we defined what shapes are and we uh, defined a representation for our shape. We showed that this uh, we showed that this assignment is a sheaf and satisfies a sheaf axiom and gluing conditions. We also defined some metrics on this space and we showed that they're stable with respect to small perturbations of our shape. But um, it would be very interesting to see if if our model can be compared to the models um, described by uh, Kendall and and also the diffeomorphism based shape space. Since we're generalizing, since we're generalizing uh, shape space models, it would be interesting to see if we can embed the traditional models of shape space into our PhD shape model. And um, another thing would be interesting to note, uh, would be interesting to see, is that um, since we showed that the since we know that the PhD is an injective transform. Um, we would like to understand the image of the shape space sheaf. So if someone gives us a derived sheaf on SD minus one cross R, when does this sheaf correspond to a shape? And this would be useful for generating new shapes, for example. Um, we define some metrics for our shape space, but we, we we computed it only for small examples like point sets or or the V shape, which I showed earlier. It would be interesting to see if we can, um, you know, say something more about general class of shapes, um, give ways to compute these distances in practice, and um, compare compare the distances we defined with existing shape space uh, shape distances and see how it performs. Um, uh, with that. Um, Thank you all. Thank you so much, Shreya. So before we get to questions, let's please unmute ourselves and applaud for the speaker. All right, questions? Let, let me start with one. So in this example, I think it was on slide around 38 or so with the blue V and the red V where you bounded the interleaving distance using you know the homeomorphisms on one side and the parallel distance on the other. So for this example, is the exact interleaving distance known, for example, or even conjectured? No. Yeah, we it's it's a little it's actually quite difficult to compute this interleaving distance because we're thickening these derived sheaves, and um, yeah, so it's yeah we haven't found this out yet. It's quite interesting. I like how concrete it is, right? You know this example. Yeah. More questions. Good morning. Can you hear me? Please yes. go ahead. Yeah, this is Paul Schrader. How are you guys today? I'm uh, new to this seminar, but I've heard quite a quite a, a lot of good news about it, so I decided to attend. Uh, I actually developed a sheaf theoretical structure based on the definition, the categorical definition from a TDA feature engineered AI ML algorithm. And I was able to construct that, um, uh, the stocks and the restriction maps in a, in a way that's appropriate so that the local to global structure is there. 
Oh, I had a question about some of your um, metrics that you're starting to utilize um, are starting to explain within um, this setting. Um, I use amplitudes of bottleneck and Wasser sign distances. Are you familiar with that approach? Mm, no. Okay, so what you would do is instead of comparing two distinct diagrams, you would get information about one diagram by comparing it to a trivial persistence diagram, for example. In that, in that respect, you can get amplitude information about the particular diagram itself without having something to compare it to. And I utilize these scalar values to create uh, vectors to go into an AI ML training scheme. But I was curious about um, if you've thought about or knew anything about amplitudes for these particular approaches, because I'm looking for this connection between the global and the local. I have this organizational chief theoretical structure over this very concrete algorithm that has topologically featured engineered characteristics to it. And I can see the structure, but and it looks pretty, but I don't see, you know, I, I want to try to start making connections and do some kind of feedback between the concrete development of the algorithm and its uh, production of data towards the sheaf theoretical construction and vice versa. So that's why I was asking. Sorry about the long-winded uh, explanation. Over. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah, that would be actually very interesting because we have, we have like a theoretical understanding of the structure, but, um, yeah, how how to actually compute these in practice is is a little more complicated. So one way, one thing that we tried out um, when we were just running some experiments was we looked at shapes and then we looked at some distribution or on of directions on 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 that shape on the sphere, and then we calculated we calculated the persistence diagrams in these in these directions, and then you know we just integrated over overall or we took a sum overall um, direction. So something, yeah, but we've, yeah, we've not done too much um, with that yet. Yeah, that's um, that's one thing. And then um, interleaving distance, I'm starting to study multi-parameter persistence homology. And I noticed that um, uh, the interleaving distance is an important aspect to understanding that. I didn't know if there was any thoughts in the future of looking at chief theoretical constructions over MPH, over. Mm -hmm. All right, further questions. Uh, I, I have a question. Hi, hi, very nice presentation. Very, very interesting work. Um, and I, I realize this is, you, you're, you're covering very interesting territory on the theoretical end and um, uh, sort of going back to the points um, of making, figuring out computational parts of this. Uh, you, you talked about this um, polyhedral approximation and getting epsilon close to a shape. Uh, I, I sort of assume that the proof is not particularly constructive, right? You don't have a process to take, um, or is it constructive? I don't want to, that's basically my question, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so actually this follows a sampling argument. So okay. if we look at any of manifold, you can just uh, sample the manifold in such a way that it's dense. So, you know, points, uh, it's a dense sample. And then if you choose like an epsilon two dense sample, uh, then you can show that actually the, uh, if you take the alpha complex of this okay. sample, that is that is the polyhedron we're looking at. And that the PhD oh, that's of the polyhedron. Oh, interesting, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. All right, that clarifies it. So this is actually sort of a hook where someone could go, you know, let me actually pick a big epsilon. Let me just do a really nasty, ugly looking polyhedron and we can do something. So that's nice. Thank you so much. All right, thanks for clarifying. Very, very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, very nice talk. Um, I have a question also regarding approximation. You mentioned the approximation here where you're approximating the 
sort of manifold with curvature, but with sort of piece, piece, piecewise linear pieces, right? Like the polyhedral pieces. Um, but when you when I first saw the words approximation, I was actually thinking the other direction because you are mentioning those complexes of across all sort of degree. And uh, I was wondering if you can actually truncate at a fixed degree, meaning that um, uh, I don't know, it's probably earlier slides where you show the the uh, the the complexes of the transform where you have the sequences right so i was wondering if you thought about the the approximation from the different perspective meaning that i have this shape i compute my persistent homology transform um but for some shape maybe i only have to go up to degree 2 maybe some shape i only have to go to degree 1 and then some higher degree, maybe there's something there, but I actually don't care. Um, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about approximation in that perspective, like trun essentially truncation uh, across degree. Yeah, that, that's actually very interesting. Um, yeah, so we just truncated it at zero, at, at, I mean, one onwards, because you know if you just look at a convex set, then the, con the sets, all the sublevel sets are contractible. But yeah, so I, I guess it could be framed more generally. So it depends on the cover elements. So, you know, if the covers are, if the covers have, you know, no H2, but have uh, H1, then then we can truncate it at, um, we can truncate it at H1. But yeah, we've not, yeah, we've not established a general theorem for this. It would just depend on the cover elements. I but see. Yeah, that's, but that's right. Right, but mm -hmm. I'm saying like if you fix the cover elements, right? You can you can say with under a fixed cover element, I can say, well, I know my shape may have like higher degree information, but I'm actually just gonna approximate it up to that. I, I feel like there's like there's some sort of stability result that is sort of begging for some sort of statement, right? Is to say that you know I can approximate up to this degree and I'm happy with it in practice. Yeah, yeah, that's that. Yeah, we haven't considered that, but. Yeah, I, I would believe something like that holds. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Well, if not, thanks so much, Shreya. And let me end the recorded portion here.